Hey everyone, thanks for being here today with me and Jack the Skeleton. Today, we're here to talk to you all about joints. We'll start off with what joints are and the general types of joints. Then we'll focus on synovial joints, the most movable type of joint. And we'll end with how joints can be thought of as levers in the body. So please, join us on this journey of growth and learning. So to start off, joints, the sparkle word for them is articulations. They mean the same thing. And a joint or an articulation is really anywhere where two or more bones connect or meet. There are approximately 230 joints in an adult body or places that bones meet. They're sometimes categorized by their degree of movement, but more recently, anatomists classify them by what holds the joint together. Synarthrotic joints are ones that have little to no motion. Amphiarthrotic joints are ones that have a medium degree of motion. And diarthrotic are joints that have full motion. You're most likely to hear this type of category though, that there are fibrous joints, which are things like the plates of the skull, or where the tibia and fibula are connected at their distal end. So there are plates of the skull, there are parts of the skull. And so places where the parietal bone meet the frontal bone, there's this zigzag where the bones grew into each other. That is an articulation because it's where two or more bones meet. And that is called a fibrous joint. They're generally immovable, though the ones that are between some of the arm bones and leg bones have slight motion. There are also cartilaginous joints, and these have cartilage between them. You can see the cartilage discs in the vertebrae, and the cartilage here at this junction of the two pelvic bones. Synovial joints are what most other joints are, and that's what we're going to focus on for the next two parts. So this is the general structure of a synovial joint. You'll see that there are two bones here. At the end of each bone is articular cartilage. Without this, the bones would grind together and wear away. Inside here, this is called the joint cavity. It's got a fluid called synovial fluid. That synovial fluid is made by a thin layer of tissue that surrounds the synovial cavity called the synovial membrane. And then outside of that thin synovial membrane is fibrous capsule, which is made of ligaments. These two things together make up the joint capsule. Some high impact joints have things called menisci or meniscus, singular, and they're made of fibrocartilage to uh, absorb impact. And again, some synovial joints have bursae or bursa is the singular and it's an extra sac of synovial membrane and synovial fluid to provide cushioning, but also allow the tendons that are part of that joint to glide past each other more easily. Now you can see here that there's some fluid in this joint, and the synovial fluid is what you're hearing when you hear your joints crack. It's that the pressure is reduced in here and little bubbles of nitrogen gas that were dissolved in the synovial fluid form bubbles just like when you open up a fresh soda. That's the cracking that you hear. Here's a list with descriptions of the six types of synovial joints. They're classified based on the shapes of the bones involved that are connecting, and those shapes impact what movements are possible at that joint. Ball and socket is where the round end of one bone fits into the cavity of another and it has the widest range of motion. It can go back and forth, it can move in this plane, and it can rotate. Those are things like the hips and the shoulders. Next are condyloid or ellipsoid joints. And it's where an oval or egg-like, so not quite round like a ball and socket, but more oval shape, end of one bone goes into an ellipse-shaped cavity of another. This allows for most movements. You would have like an egg shape and kind of a shape like this. 
and the movements can go one way, they can go in the other plane, but no rotation is allowed. The connections between a metacarpal and the first phalanx in that finger are an example of this joint. It's why you can move your fingers in one plane, in another plane, but you can't rotate them. Next are gliding joints or plane joints. It's where there are flat sections of two bones that just move past each other or they can rotate slightly. These are the places where the carpals or the tarsals connect. So all of these flat parts of the wrist bones where they touch can allow for some gliding or slight rotation. Hinge joints are next. It's where a convex surface goes into a concave surface. An example would be here with the humerus and the ulna. So you can see the convex and the concave. And it really just allows for flexion and extension. The rotation of the lower arm is not due to this joint, but it's due to the radius and this part of the humerus. The joints of the phalanges are also this type. In a saddle joint, you've got two saddle-shaped surfaces, and they can go in one plane and in the other, but again, no rotation. The thumb metacarpal to its carpal is that type here. And last on my list are pivot joints. It's where you have a cylindrical extension of a bone that goes into a ring of tissue, whether it's just bone or whether it's bone with some ligament there. I'm going to show you that. It really just allows rotation. The atlas and axis are the two first cervical vertebrae, C1 and C2. And the pivot joint here is this part of the axis sticking up into this part of the atlas, C1 and C2. Now the last topic for today is how joints work together with muscles to work as levers and allow different types of movement in the body. A lever really has just three parts, a fulcrum, a load that is being lifted, and some sort of effort that is applied. In diagrams, those are represented as a triangle, a square, and a hollow arrow. Now this applies to joints because the fulcrum or the pivot point of a lever is really the joint where the two bones meet. The load is whatever weight you're lifting, whether it's a body part or something the body part itself is trying to lift, and the effort is provided by your muscles. In a first class lever, the fulcrum is in the middle. The load is on one side and the effort is on the other. What's interesting about a first class lever is that the effort, the pull of the effort, would cause the load to move in the opposite direction. This would be like the muscles in the back of the neck here. This would be the neck itself, and this would be most of the head, the forehead, the face. So as the muscles in the back of the neck pull down, the head tilts up. In a second class lever, the load is in the middle with the fulcrum, the pivot on one side and the effort on the other. In this case, the effort and the load are going to move in the same direction. The muscle would pull up, the load would pull up. You also get a mechanical advantage. The distance from the fulcrum to the effort is greater than the distance from the fulcrum to the load. And so you get a mechanical advantage. You can use these types of levers in your life to lift something that you normally wouldn't be able to. An example here would be if this were your foot, this was the ball of your foot or your toes, this would be your calf muscle contracting and lifting up, and the load would be your entire body. So you can lift your entire body with that one muscle because the fulcrum is over here. And in a third class lever, the effort is in the middle with the load on one side and the fulcrum on the other. Now in this case, the effort, the direction of it is going to cause the load to move in that same direction. Now here you actually get a mechanical disadvantage. It is harder 
to lift this load by using the same amount of effort when it's closer to the fulcrum. And the way to picture this, this would be like the fulcrum could be your elbow, this would be your forearm, you're trying to lift something or just the forearm itself, and the effort would be your bicep pulling up. So I hope this all was clear enough. If not, I blame Chatty Cathy here for not being clear enough. But if not, then come to class with questions. You'll be able to look at the skeleton and look at those different shapes and move them around if you want to, to look at the different types of movement that you get and how they might provide some type of advantage or disadvantage as a lever. So thanks for being here, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in class. Boop, 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 boop.